Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, welcome everyone to this NRRA webinar on the latest in concrete pavement design procedures. It's uh, sponsored by the NRRA rigid team and our presenters today are Lev Kazanovich and Julie Vandenbosch with the University of Pittsburgh. For those of you who are not familiar with the NRRA, it's, it stands for the National Road Research Alliance and it's a pooled fund collaborative organization consisting of 10 government agencies and over 60 associate members focused on conducting and implementing research related to pavements. One of its primary charges is to determine suitability and research, timely research being conducted at the Min Road facility. Now the creation of this webinar came about due to the need to cancel our annual uh, NRRA workshop and conference last month due to the ongoing pandemic. And while we had looked forward to a three hour long workshop in May on this in presenting great detail on the topics discussed today, we are uh, trying to avoid web fatigue and have basically formatted this to the uh, much shorter 75 minute presentation. Uh, we hope to present the basic content, the concepts of uh, each of the procedures and we hope that any questions you have, you can uh, seek the presenters in, in the, as you need it in the future. Today you'll be placed, participants will be placed in the listen only mode and any questions you should be typed into the Q&A box. Hopefully you can find that. Uh, try to avoid the chat box. It doesn't serve the same function. So please seek out the, the Q&A box. And periodically throughout the webinar, I will um, typically after each topic, I'll, I'll read out each of the questions out loud and, and we'll get a response from the presenters. Uh, those will be limited in, in the middle of the webinar to about five minute Q&A sessions and any, any unanswered questions will be answered offline after and made available to end attendees uh, within one week. Today's uh, presenters are Lev Kazanovich, who is Anthony Gill Professor of Civil Engineering with the University of Pittsburgh since 2017. Prior to that, he was a professor at the University of Minnesota. He's been, he served as a principal investigator on many high profile research projects sponsored by FHWA, NCHRP, SHARP, and transportation agencies. He played a major role in the development of concrete payment models for the Ashto Payment ME, as well as recently completed U-Ball design procedure. Julie Vandenbosch is the William Kepler Whiteford Professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at University of Pittsburgh and also director of the IRISE. She worked for the Minnesota Department of Transportation for five years prior to joining the University of Pittsburgh. She also served as principal investigators on many similar projects as Lev did with FHWA, NCHRP, SHARP, and other state agent transportation agencies. She played a major role in the validation of the models for Ashto Payment ME and was the primary developer of the BCOA-ME. The order of today's presentations will be Lev will start by talking about pit rigid. This will be followed by Julie talking about the BCOA-ME. And then finally a team effort on the U-Ball design procedure, which just came out recently. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Lev to begin his presentation. Uh, um, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, National <coughs> Road Research Alliance for giving us an opportunity to present um, our research. My first presentation will be on the design tool Petrigid. It was sponsored by the Center for <coughs> Impactful, in, 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 Impactful Resilient Infrastructure Science and in Engineering, IRIS. This, uh, uh, is a cooperative research uh, consortium led by Professor uh, Julie Van der Bush. Uh, like National Road Research <coughs> Alliance, it focuses on implementable uh, research leading to a more durable, um, long lasting uh, highway infrastructure. Arise bring together experts from public and private sector and uh, <coughs> academia and uh, 
<clears throat> Arise members are involved at every step of the research from formulation of the problem statement to implementation of the results of the research. Uh, one of the first RIS project was the development of a simplified mechanistical empirical design tool for Pennsylvania rigid um, payments. Um, the current Pennsylvania design method for rigid payments is <clears throat> outdated. It based on the um, <clears throat> empirical Ashton 93 procedure and often leads to very conservative design solutions. Pennsylvania is considering a transition to the <clears throat> Ashton mechanistic empirical uh, design. Um, the the Ashton uh, design <clears throat> often offers many improvements over the current payment uh, design guides. It leads to more cost-effective and sustainable design solutions. A, a recent study conducted by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology found that implementation of the MEPDG is the most cost-effective way to reduce the carbon footprint of the highway infrastructure. However, there are several concerns that need to be addressed when implementing this procedure. The MEPDG is substantially more complex than the previous design procedures. It requires the user to provide substantially more inputs uh, and uh, some required data that hasn't been commonly used in the past. Improper, improper assignment of those parameters may lead to design errors. The next several slides show examples of the Ashtaway Payment ME <coughs> program input screens. The program requires to provide more than 100 design parameters, including in, Design features, you can see on this slide, a very comprehensive uh, climate inputs, a detailed traffic in, in information, and a, a comprehensive information on uh, material properties for each layer. Uh, Ashta payment to me license is, ex is expensive and uh, this and other factors create hesitation by states and local transportation agencies to fully implement MEPDG. The for state and local agencies um, need a simplified mechanistic empirical uh, design alternative that is compatible with an um, Ashta me proce um, process. Several years ago, the Minnesota Department of Transportation sponsored the development of mean pay rigid, and here you can see an input screen of this program. Uh, I was fortunate to serve as a PI on the development of the first version of uh, this program, and after that it was improved by um, uh, Dr. <coughs> Derek Tompkins and by uh, Mindat engineers. Uh, uh, but the experience of development of this product was very useful for <coughs> our project. And we basically followed the same steps uh, uh, in the development of mean pay rigid. Uh, it's important to note that when mean pay rigid was developed, the payment in me was mainly a, an analysis tool. Uh, and Mean pave rigid is the, the design tool only. It provides uh, the, the required <coughs> concrete payment thickness. Um, over the time, uh, the payment to me became more and uh, more and more robust, the design tool. But um, the, uh, so we felt that pit rigid should, um, should combine past the features of both tools so it should be a design and analysis tool at the same time. So, uh, when we started the development of um, pit rigid with a sensitivity the analysis, uh, well, first we reviewed the payment in me uh, software, the latest version, and we reviewed the, the most recent sensitivity studies, and then we conducted our own sensitivity study 
for Pennsylvania conditions. We evaluated sensitivity to climate, traffic, uh, design features, and material properties. I sh just show a few examples. So we analyzed the effect of uh, more than 30 weather stations located in Pennsylvania and the neighboring states. And we performed the sensitivity of the climate uh, <clears throat> of the payment side location to the uh, predicted fatigue damage and uh, um, differential energy of subgrade information. The first is important for uh, fatigue tracking and the second for joint faulting. It's important to know that we did not evaluate the sensitivity of the weather stations to the cracking itself because the cracking level depends on the traffic level, whereas the uh, uh, damage level is independent um, <clears throat> from the traffic level. So in, in, in this, in, based on the results of this analysis, we grouped the weather, um, all the locations to five uh, um, five regions, five groups based on the close proximities of the uh, proximity of the weather stations and the similarity in the fatigue damage. The slide shows sensitivity of fatigue damage, uh, the predicted fatigue damage for nine inch thick uh, joint and concrete pavement with a tight PCC shoulder. So, and, and so basically we recommended to divide Pennsylvania into five regions. Basically they, they respond to the, uh, <clears throat> the, the districts, except uh, one place where district one was we separated region close to Lake Erie into separate um, region because of, uh, of the lake effect. Uh, this slide shows the effect of the base type on the predicted fatigue damage. And you see that uh, the use of stabilized base may significantly affect uh, the, uh, the predicted <clears throat> damage level, whereas the effect of base thickness is not as significant. Uh, so based on the results of the sensitivity study, we uh, <laughs> selected the values of or ranges of the payment ME inputs that were, were fixed in, in Pit, uh, pit rigid or, um, or um, <clears throat> identify the ranges of, of, of certain values that can be changed by the, by the user. For example, user can change the design reliability level, uh, the uh, volume of the daily lead track traffic, the compound rate he can select from, he can select from one of three uh, traffic patterns, select the number of lanes, change concrete models of rupture, coefficient in term expansion, shoulder type, um, uh, concrete slab width and base type. And other parameters were set to the default values recommended by the Applied Research Associate for Pennsylvania conditions. After that, we ran a huge factorial of payment in Iran, so actually ran more than, than 1 million cases. And we developed simplified models for uh, fatigue cracking and the differential energy. This uh, slide shows the uh, fatigue damage, which pre, uh, the regression model the, the, that is based on the daily traffic, uh, daily track traffic, uh, uh, normalized concrete strength, and um, and, um, and, and various regression coefficients alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Uh, they depend on the the concrete thickness, the joint spacing, uh, uh, lane width, and other parameters. And, and after that, we developed a simplified tools. First, we developed the uh, uh, desktop version, so the, you can see a demo of the program, so the user can provide information on the payment project, select a region in which the payment is located, um, so, uh, Design life, cracking reliability, uh, faulting reliability here intentionally made an error in the assigned reliability level. Uh, you provide the traffic volume, compound growth rate, number of lanes, and joint spacing, 
this case, let me start with 15, then fit, select, uh, in this case, we select interstate, uh, uh, rural interstate traffic pattern, we we'll use a conventional lane width, an asphalt shoulder, uh, change models of rupture to 650 PSI, and the coefficient of term expansion of 5.5 and 10 minus 6, 1 over Fahrenheit. And we use an um, <coughs> asphalt treated base. And after that, when we click the run button, well, of course, first we, we need to ch correct all the errors. So we'll check the reliability level. Try to run again. And the program pr produces the required slot thickness, the required dial diameter, and uh, reports a cracking level of various reliability level. In addition, the user can see a faulting and cracking development over time, as well as, uh, as a projected traffic volume and projected number of easels. Um, as I said, the, <clears throat> this program is not, uh, well, first we can save the project for future use. And we can um, prepare, in this case, it will be project and save, uh, saved. And after that, we can generate a report. And it will generate an XML file. So this demonstration shows how the design mode of the program, but, but we can, it's, the program can be used just for performance prediction. So in this case, we can see that what happened if we, uh, if we change the dial diameter like to one inch, before it was 1.5 inch required. In this case, you see that predicted faulting is much higher than allowable, so one inch dial is not adequate. Naturally, Kraken uh, can, did not change. Uh, the, the, the current analysis was performed with the um, uh, defaults recommended by IRA, but we can also change it to national defaults or user can use uh, custom uh, default parameters. In this case, you see which we changed the, uh, the analysis for the national default parameters. And And, and this slide shows the, the report generated by Richard. So in addition to some of inputs and outputs that um, um, you could see on the screen, the, the, reports, the report also provides all the default values that were used in, in the analysis. So basically default values that were used by the payment ME when the database of the uh, <clears throat> fatigue damage and uh, differential energies <clears throat> were generated. So this version program is available, but to make it more widely available, we I was going to show you that there was a um, web-based program. <clears throat> We're currently working on the on the web-based program, but somehow I managed to, to close that that file. So um, if I have if I have a chance, I will <clears throat> I will demonstrate it later. But basically, basically to, um, uh, we we compared. Um, Cracking prediction and faulting prediction for this, for this program. So in this case, we see a very high traffic level, 1.5 million, uh, 1,500 million ESOL. So it does it would, uh, uh, it's intentionally high to compare predictions for thick PTC slabs. But basically, you see that our uh, pit rigid is very close with predictions to payment to me. And a certain case, like for 
12.75 inches. Actually, we believe our predictions are more reasonable than uh, pay and me because we don't have any jumps in the in the predictions. But the difference is very small anyway. And the faulting predictions are very similar. Uh, so basically, to conclude my presentation is that um, I would like, to, first of all, to, re to, uh, to remind you that heat rigid ME and mean PAVE rigids are not intended to replace PAVE in ME, but uh, used to simplify it, and they're very useful for routine design, but for special cases, PAVE in ME should be used. And it rigid is a is a simple design analysis tool for Pennsylvania concrete payments. It will I hope it will help speed up implementation of, uh, of the MAPDG in Pennsylvania uh, because it matches payment ME for selected set of inputs. It can be expanded for other design inputs. Uh, can be updated after local calibration for the improved performance predictions uh, models. Actually, currently we are defined the fault in model for payment to me, and we hope incorporate it into Pete Richard when it's uh, <clears throat> when it is ready. And finally, we can say that this tool can be, be adapted for <clears throat> other locations as well. If you'd like to get more information, so I would like to refer you to an RI's website. It's shown here. That basically concludes my presentation. I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. Tom? Hello? <clears throat> can you hear me? I can. Maybe Tom is on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. All right. Thank you for your presentation. Um, again, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A box right now. So if anyone has a question in the next minute or two, we're, we're right on time. Please quickly type it in and we'll, we'll address those questions before we move on. Okay, I see. I see a question coming in the chat box. That's okay. Uh, well, can we? Yeah, can we use different climates? Is the question. Um, it well. In <clears throat> the frame, the framework is developed be uh, used for <clears throat> any climate location, but we need to generate uh, the database of the payment ME responses and. But, but the answer is, yes, it's, um, it, it can be adapted. Uh, the next, it will require some efforts. Okay, next question is, how is the payment response calculated? Uh, well, we, we don't calculate payment responses rather than we uh, used uh, payment to me to generate a database of fatigue damages and we use uh, uh, machine learning techniques to, to generate the models for the differential energies and after that we, we use for generate, generate um, differential energy and fatigue damages and you and from those models for fatigue damages and differential energies we compute cracking and faulting and, and as you can see we we match the results very closely so basically uh, um, uh, Pit Richard um, can uh, generate the results that are very similar to payment to me, but it will be done in a fraction of seconds. Okay, and uh, there was a similar question. I think you probably addressed it. So a very similar uh, question. Uh, with that, we'll move on to our next presenter. Which will be Julie.
All right, great. Thanks, Tom. Can you hear me any better than before? Yes, loud and clear. Yep. Awesome. Okay. So I assume everybody can uh, see my PowerPoint at this at this uh, point, right? Yes. Okay, great. So uh, thanks to NRA for uh, hosting this, and I'll be talking about the design of bonded concrete overlays on asphalt and uh, So the, the first thing, just a quick reminder of what this is, um, commonly previously referred to as bonded white topping, so three to six inches uh, thick, typical for highways. And this is a thin concrete overlay placed on top of either a distressed asphalt pavement or a distressed composite pavement. Um, one question that comes up frequently is, uh, well, if you're, what's the difference between a bonded concrete overlay on a composite pavement and an unbonded concrete overlay on a composite pavement? And um, the, the difference is that uh, when you're designing an unbonded concrete overlay, you want to have a thin asphalt layer that's going to um, perform as a slip plane. So that will just keep the stress from uh, migrating up into the overlay, where if you're doing a bonded concrete overlay, you're going to have more asphalt down there so that you're actually engaging the asphalt into uh, to assist in carrying the load. So with a bonded concrete overlay, you're going to have you know upwards of, of three inches where an unbonded, it's going to be one to two inches. If you're kind of in between those and maybe want to consider uh, designing it in both ways and look at the thicknesses that are, are provided. So. I'm sorry, Julie. Yes. Uh can I interrupt? You may want sure. to change to the slide mode because right now we're seeing um, your next slide as pre being presented as opposed to. Uh, okay. Yeah. How's that, Tom? Uh, nope. Still the same? Yeah, still doing a split screen. All right. I think that has to do with the, the multiple screen so how's that yep that fixed it thank you uh. up here on probably on your next presentation. <laughs> no, okay. Here. Yeah. Oh, since. All right. There we go. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So, uh, I guess um, we then talk about suitable candidates that uh, would be appropriate. And of course, this is the nice uh, graphic that was uh, adopted from the CP Tech Center where you have a distressed overlay. Uh, if it's in relatively good condition, you can put a bonded concrete overlay on top of that. Uh, if not, then you might be able to do some uh, limited repairs and then uh, put the, the bonded concrete overlay on top of the, the repaired asphalt. Uh, distressed pavement. So the other common question you get is how much bond is needed? And, um, you know, that's not a, a one size fits all answer. So the thinner the, the overlay is, the more it's going to engage that asphalt into carrying the, the, uh, the load. And the thicker it is, if you're around five inches or more, well, the concrete pavement's carrying most of the load anyway. So regarding bond and the quality of asphalt under or underneath, it's not as important. So that kind of ties us in too with respect to, you know, the difference between a bonded concrete uh, overlay or bonded white topping and conventional white topping. And why should we acknowledge a difference between the two? And then that goes back into the whole topic of this presentation with respect to design. So in the previous slide, when we talked about the thinner concrete overlays uh, requiring that asphalt to carry the load and the thicker concrete, you have so much rigidity in that, that overlay that at some point it's carrying most of the load 
with respect to the asphalt uh, uh, itself. And so, you know, where does this this switch modes? And typically, if you're going to be around six and a half inches, then you know you might be right on the border of whether it's acting as a bonded concrete overlay or a conventional white topping. So if you used um, if you're designing uh, for white topping, then these are the the tools that you have: um, the BCOAME, pavement ME, the Astro Design Procedure, uh, the um, ACPA BCOA Thickness Designer, and the the Colorado uh, Design Procedure. So if I'm designing an overlay, a white topping overlay, what do I use? Well, if it's a conventional white topping, then you're going to design it just as a jointed plain concrete pavement on an asphalt stabilized base. And of course, you'll use either the 93 or the pavement ME to do this. Um, and you know the thing is too, if you are going to design uh, a bonded concrete overlay where it's a relatively thin structure, it's not going to give you the credit that you need. And so it's going to, using these design procedures and ignoring that bonding, you will underestimate what the design life is going to be. So if indeed you're going to uh, have a, a thin concrete overlay and rely on that asphalt to bond it to, then you're going to want to switch back to the tools that are specific for designing a bonded concrete overlay or a, a bonded white topping, if you will. So these would be the tools, the Colorado design procedure, which is kind of the premise of, of the BCOA, as is the ACPA. And then you also have the, the pavement, uh, the Astra Wear Pavement ME, where specifically you would probably be doing the short uh, joint, because if you're not using this short joint module, then you're just designing it as a conventional white topping. So now I have four different options to consider. Uh, you know, we know how to found, find pavement ME, the uh, the PCA procedure is available online if you go to the Colorado website. And if you just Google BCOAME, then both the, the PIT BCOAME and um, the ACPA BCOA thickness designer tools will come right up. And uh, you can follow those links to get to those tools. Well, when selecting the appropriate tool with each of these different design procedures, they are looking at different things. So they are all for bonded concrete overlay, but they look at different failure modes. And so when you're using a bonded concrete overlay, you have to be careful what you're designing for and which tool you're using. So what's going to dictate the appropriate tool goes back to the panel size you're going to select. So at this point, everybody's pretty familiar with the, the effects of the panel size with respect to the, the wheel path and where you might be uh, and how close you are to those longitudinal joints. And then those are going to dictate the location and the type of failure that you have. So with the smaller panel sizes, you're going to have a corner break. With the uh, five by six, six by six panel sizes, that mid-size slab, You'll have predominantly longitudinal cracks. And then if you're using a, um, a full lane width, then of course you're going to have transverse mid slab cracks. So when we're selecting a design tool, we wanna to make sure that we're designing for the type of dis distress mode that that particular pavement is going to see. So if we have uh, the smaller panel sizes where we're going to have corner breaks, then the BCOAME and the ACPA uh, BCOA designer app will both uh, be good tools for designing for the smaller slab sizes. If you have the mid slab sizes where your predominant mode of failure is going to be longitudinal or diagonal crack, then you'll be using the BCOA ME or the pavement ME uh, short joint um, PCP module. So not the conventional, but the short joint. And then, of course, if you have a larger full lane width, um, you're going to potentially have mid slab uh, cracks. So cracks that are, are joining at, at mid slab in the longitudinal direction, cracks that develop potentially in the wheel path at the intersection of the transverse joint in the wheel path, and then potentially transverse cracks. So the Colorado DOT design procedure uh, accounts for these um, size structures. And you can also use pavement ME, but then you're going to want to use the uh, uh, the jointed plain concrete um, module. Uh, and it's not going to, of course, look at longitudinal cracks. You only look at the transverse crack failures. So um, this is for 
pavements that overlays that will be six and a half inches or less. If you're going to get thicker than that, or if you're around that uh, area, you might want to look at both a conventional design where you're going to use either the Nash, the Astro 93 or the pavement ME, and you're just looking at uh, the development of transverse cracks. So um, again, when you're using the pavement ME, just remember that it's not going to be accounting for the longitudinal cracks that you uh, can get in these, um, these uh, bonded concrete overlays. So then we focus in on the difference between uh, these different design options. And again, for the BCUA ME and the ACPA BCUA designer app, those are going to give you pretty comparable results because uh, the BCUA was uh, developed on a lot of these pioneering um, models in the ACPA BCUA app. And uh, when you get to the mid slab, there's going to be differences between these predictions and these design procedures. So we shared the calibration um, database. Uh, the pavement ME extended it out further in uh, sections we didn't want to include in ours because of uh, some various aspects of, of those sections. But in general, the calibration database was uh, similar with the BCUA being a, a subset of the, the pavement ME. With the larger slabs, the BCUA ME and the Colorado DOT procedure are going to be quite uh, similar. But of course, with the, the pavement ME, that's going to be based on a conventional um, pavement and not considering as much the, the bonded aspect of the, the overlay. So when we have these two in the mid slab, the six by six panels that seem to be quite common, um, what are the differences? So of course, uh, with this, the primary mode of failure is the longitudinal cracking at mid slab that we're looking at. Um, with the BCOA in looking at the response models, uh, we're looking from three to six and a half inches where the short joint went from four to, to H. Again, uh, once you start getting out to, um, you know, six and a half or above, you might want to start considering designing that as a conventional pavement because the, that overlay is so, uh, the, the, the fluctual rigidity is so high that it really doesn't engage the asphalt as much. Um, and then you have the, the panel sizes that are considered and those are, are of the same. The other difference between the BCUA ME is uh, the condition of the existing asphalt um, is considered in this. So you will enter in whether it's adequate or marginal. And then based on the same uh, models used on the asphalt design and pavement ME, it correlates the fatigue cracking to adjustments in the asphalt stiffness. So for the BCUA ME, if it's either adequate or marginal, you know, ranging from zero to 15% fatigue cracking, uh, then that's going to be um, giving you a damage factor of 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. So it's going to reduce the asphalt stiffness by 10 to 20% to reflect the uh, fatigue damage in the asphalt. Um, so this is the fatigue cracking based on distress observed at the, on the surface. And in these relationships, of course, they, they weren't developed by us. That was part of uh, the asphalt um, design for pavement ME. Um, for the, the pavement ME's short joint, what they do is reduce the asphalt stiffness by 65%. So that's a damage of 1.1. So they're really reducing it quite a bit. And that's to account for the fact that um, when they're looking at the, the pavement structure, they're just looking at it as an equivalent slab and not two separate slabs that are debonding. And so they need to reduce this by quite a bit to get the system sufficiently uh, less stiff that it can develop damage. So as sort of a, a calibration component uh, that, that's built in, and that's why you can't put in the asphalt condition uh, and have that re reflected in the design. You can put in the, the binder, and so that the stiffness of the binder will reflect with what's going on uh, in the field where the stiffness of the binder and the BCA ME is selected based on LTPB bind and the geographical conditions. All right, so this just is showing why they need to reduce that asphalt stiffness by quite a bit in the pavement ME. They're using a one slab system as opposed to modeling it as a, a concrete overlay on top of an asphalt layer. Um, 
The other thing that uh, you do have in the BSU AME that uh, might or might not be concerned is reflective transverse cracks. So uh, if you have a, reflect, a, a transverse crack in your existing pavement, then it'll tell you uh, whether you will or will not see it on the surface. And then you can do some uh, pre-overlay techniques to prevent that. I think MnDOT doesn't um, mind if they have a couple that come up. So uh, that wouldn't be really a consideration, but it doesn't affect the thickness. It just tells you whether, uh, if you do want to prevent that, that you should take some precautionary uh, means within the, the construction process. Other differences between the two design procedures for these mid-slab sizes is that um, the B2AME has incorporated uh, Jeff Rossler's uh, work from the University of Illinois to account for, for fibers, um, and that's not yet considered in pavement ME. The traffic with the BSUA ME, you can enter in easels or um, you can uh, enter in um, daily traffic and then pick a, a load spectra. And the nice thing about pavement ME, of course, is that you can put in different axle configurations uh, in axle weight so you can design a specific load spectra for um, like, for example, if you were next to a landfill or something like that. The disadvantage of both of these procedures is that uh, they don't account for faulting. Um, NRRA uh, has um, provided some uh, funding to help uh, incorporate some of the, the faulting models that were being developed under, under PennDOT. Uh, at a, a national level into BSU AME. So we're hoping in the next, um, uh, I guess the next six months or so that we'll have that incorporated into the BSU AME and, and then hopefully the, the pavement, the ash to where will we'll follow suit as well. So I think I'm right about on schedule, right, Tom? And uh, I'm not sure if I probably have a few minutes for questions, I guess. Is that correct, Tom? Yes, yes. Uh, we'll take any questions now. There's currently nothing typed in the Q&A or the chat box, so go ahead if you have any immediate questions. I will say that uh, we found in a study kind of looking at our white toppings that we actually see a lot less transverse reflective cracking than I once thought that we had, so that's kind of good news that we're not seeing especially with the smaller panel sizes, I think they capture, a lot of the cracks are transferred to the transverse joints. That's great. Have you compared that to what would have been predicted to see how that matches up? No, we have not. Yeah, that might be fun to do. Any other questions? Oh, <laughs> Ben says, who's in the truck? Okay. <laughs> Some lighthearted questions. So. <laughs> well, that would be Megan and Caitlin <laughs> <laughs> about 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. They're much larger now. Yeah. Okay, here's a question Is BCOA a mechanistic procedure? Yes, it's a, a mechanistic procedure. So, what we do is uh, it's the same process as. Um, you know, we have for most of the, the mechanistic procedures so that we have um, a, uh, a database of responses that we're generating using abacus models and then uh, just like uh, pavement ME, newer not, neural networks were developed for um, rapidly uh, predicting them and then we uh, account for, to, to disconnect the prediction from the enhanced integrated climatic model uh, models were generated outside of that so that if you enter in your geographic location and your pavement structure it'll account for uh, an equivalent damage for both the temperature of the asphalt which correlates to an asphalt stiffness which of course is important for the um, which is of course important for uh, these bonded concrete overlays and it also accounts for developing an effective equivalent linear temperature gradient that can be applied. So um, the exact same process that's involved in the, the uh, pavement ME was 
done here with the additional work of decoupling it from the enhanced integrated climatic model for accounting for the um, uh, temperature conditions. Okay, no more questions being typed in, so we're going to try to stay on time. And uh, next presentation will be about the uh, the new uh, U ball design procedure, which just got wrapped up after a six year uh, pooled fund effort. So go ahead, uh, Julie. All right. Everybody seeing just one slide or is it sharing again? It's still sharing. Okay. How's that? Yes. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so as uh, Tom had mentioned, uh, again, um, with this design procedure, MnDOT was the, the lead state and a lot of the NR members were uh, also contributing on this pooled fund study. And the idea was to um, develop a design procedure for unbonded concrete overlays um, that would take into account the actual structure of the overlay instead of trying to extrapolate a jointed plane concrete payment design to a, an unbonded overlay. So um, Dr. Lev Kazanovich was the PI and uh, Steve and I were working with him on this at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, Mike Snyder was involved as well. And so what we're going to do is the presentation will consist of two components where I will discuss the aspects of the inner layer system and the faulting because that was the component of the model that, uh, or the, the design process that I worked on. And then Dr. Kazanovich will follow up with a discussion on the, the cracking and um, the development of the software tool, which was the component of the research that he focused on. So uh, again, just a, a quick definition to get us all on the same page where we have unbonded concrete overlays and there we have an existing pavement that's um, you know, moderately to significantly deteriorated and um, we're placing an, an inner layer in between that and the concrete overlay on top of it. Um, and so the existing concrete payment can be heavily distressed, but it has to be stable and uniform in support that it's providing. And then the uh, inner layer um, will then help keep the distress and existing pavement from reflecting up into the overlay. And that inner layer can be typically either uh, an asphalt um, pavement or um, what's becoming uh, common now is using a, a non-woven geotextile fabric. And so these uh, concrete overlays are obviously going to be thicker than the bonded overlays where you're engaging the lower layer to help transfer or carry the load. And so these are six to eight inches typically, provides a nice durable surface and uh, definitely increases the structural capacity. So. Um, the focus of this development of the new um, overlay design procedure was looking at the inner layer, and we know historically that has a huge effect on the performance of the overlay, but our design methodologies prior to this didn't capture the effects of the inner layer on the performance of the overlay. So a lot of this presentation is going to be talking about the role of the inner layer and then how it's considered in the new design process. So uh, the role of the inner layers, as we had mentioned um, in the previous overlay, is to provide that slip plane and stress absorption so that you're delaminating the two layers, you're allowing the a shear plane to, to provide that slip and preventing the distress from propagating from that existing pavement structure into the overlay. And also a lot of times now it's being used as drainage as well. So um, if we look at the different types of materials commonly used for the inner layer, of course, the non-woven geotextile fabric is, is becoming more and more common. Um, traditionally, we used asphalt and that was either a dense or an open graded new asphalt uh, layer that was placed on the distressed existing pavement or if it was a composite pavement, then um, you might be playing it right, placing it right on top of the, the asphalt, or you might be milling down the asphalt a little bit, depending on the, the thickness of the asphalt um, 
prior to placing the overlay. So again, you're, if it's an asphalt interlayer, then commonly it's only going to be one and a half, uh, one, two inches in thickness just to provide that slip plane and not to be used for carrying um, additional load. So what we want uh, with respect to performance, we want to make sure that it resists uh, reflective cracking. It has sufficient stiffness that it's not going to break down under traffic and it's also erosion resistant. And you know, to have success, if you follow these five steps, you should be okay. And so when you're looking at the inner layer, you wanna balance permeability and strength again. So permeability is providing you with drainability, but you still need sufficient strength that it's not going to break down uh, as uh, traffic goes over it. Erosion resistance is uh, important and we're familiar with how to make asphalt erosion resistant because of course um, we use asphalt all the time, but we need to make sure too that that's of concern for our inner layer. Um, proper compaction is achieved, especially when you have new asphalt inner layers and you know the thought might be, well, we can construct this and we really don't have to worry about um, compacting it because we're putting another concrete overlay on top. Well, you don't want it to consolidate after the fact, especially adjacent to those transverse joints and the wheel path where you could develop um, longitudinal cracking at that intersection of the wheel path and the transverse joint. So if you have asphalt, then it's of course good to keep moisture out of the system and any moisture that's infiltrating through the cracks and the, the pavement, um, it's nice to have a drainage path to uh, outlets or to get the water out through the, the side of the pavement. And if you talk to the, the Michigan DOT, they are the ones that first pointed out um, this, this issue, I think, and, and really have talked a lot about it and have a lot of great knowledge and, and uh, information on what does and doesn't happen if you don't have a good drainage path to get that water out of the pavement structure. So with the um, unbonded overlay uh, design, we're going to try to account for the first couple of these components in the design process so that, you know, depending on what, how you achieve this, it will affect your design and your performance. So you can adjust these and, and make sure that um, you're getting the performance that you need based on what you're using. So permeability and strength. The other three, you're going to want to make sure that those are accomplished just through best practices during the, the construction maintenance and design process. So when we start talking about how we're incorporating this inner layer into the design of an unbonded overlay, uh, what was done was we incorporated the Totsky model. And the reason why this was so pivotal is because it allowed us to separate the overlay from the existing pavement and look at how they re respond um, independently. So in pavement ME, what it does is it uses a, an equivalent slab system. So the overlay in the existing pavement uh, and the inner layer are all combined into one, um, one slab, if you will. Well, by incorporating the Totsky model, what we do is we have the overlay and then we model that inner layer as a bed of springs. Then we have the existing pavement and then the bed of springs underneath that that allows us to model the granular layers underneath the existing slab. So it accommodates the, the ability to look at the overlay, the existing slab, the subgrade support, the cushioning effect of the different inner layer types. Um, and then if you have mismatched joints between the overlay and the um, existing pavement, we can accommodate that. So this is why uh, this model was used when looking at predicting the response, whether it be for faulting or cracking um, in, the, uh, in the new UBOL design um, procedure. So the thing is then, since we've never used this before, uh, what do we define for the stiffness of these springs? And there was a laboratory study that was involved that looked at a lot of different things, reflective cracking, friction, uh, vertical resistance. But the thing that I want to just mention here is this is how we define the stiffness of these springs based on the type of um, uh, inner layer systems that we had. So in the lab, we had some specimens where we had a concrete overlay beam and that was placed on top of different types of inner layers in MnDOT and the Michigan DOT and PennDOT. There are um, all very helpful in providing us with in situ specimens. So in situ pavements with asphalt on top of them. So it was 
able to mimic the age and condition of those. And they, we had dense graded, open graded, milled, unmilled, old, new. Um, and we're able to look at that and see how these different inner layers affected performance. And again, for this, what we we're looking at specifically was how stiff should those springs be? And we looked at both the lab data as well as FWD data provided uh, out at Minroad by MnDOT and also by the Michigan DOT uh, for their non-woven geotextile fabric and a couple of their unbonded overlays. And what we found is that regardless of whether it was field data or lab data, the stiffness of the spring was about 3,500 PSI per inch for the asphalt and for the non-woven uh, it was 425 PSI per inch. So, um, and that was pretty consistent regardless of the temperature of the, the asphalt. So we incorporated that into the models, and when we're looking at pavement response, we're then able to separate out these uh, the existing pavement, the inner layer, and the overlay. And the way that I accommodated that and used that in, in faulting is by saying, okay, well, um, now we're able to look at deflections uh, right under the overlay, which is going to influence the amount of energy that goes into the erosion, uh, which results in faulting in that inner layer, as opposed to looking at the deflections under the whole slab system, the overlay, the inner layer in the existing pavement structure. So to do that, we use a similar um, approach to what Pavement ME does for conventional pavements, but now we're looking at deflection of the overlays. Um, we also looked at erosion and treated erosion a different a little bit differently, and we recognize that the layer being eroded is not the subgrade, but it's that inner layer. So to do that, uh, we came out with some different calibration coefficients. Um, here were the original uh, on the far right that were in pavement ME, uh, then the current pavement ME that we developed um, here at Pitt for the national calibration, and then what was developed for the UBOL uh, ME. And you'll see that um, with the UBOL ME, we now have a coefficient that accounts for, for dowels specifically. So we're looking at the accumulation of damage differently, whether it's doweled or undoweled. Um, other factors, uh, you'll see where we have a large discrepancy between this calibration and previous is in the C5 calibration coefficient. And that is because we account for erosion directly uh, now, and I'll talk about that in a second. And then the other is the C8 coefficient. Before that was just sort of a, a damage coefficient and it wasn't a calibration factor uh, because if, if you're familiar with the calibration process, it's not possible to really use that or, or optimize based on, on that parameter. So um, that parameter then was switched to more of a, a scaling factor and uh, it helped differentiate between the full lane width slabs and the, the partial uh, lane widths because this design procedure looks at not only full lane width but also the, the six by six. So when we look at erodibility before in pavement ME, what they did is they just said, all right, we're going to assign erodibility factor one to five, depending on um, how erodible. So regardless of the asphalt type, that would be a one. And if it's really erodible, then that would be a five. Well, in this, what we did is we said, all right, well, we know that these inner layers affect the performance. We just can't say that all the asphalt inner layers in the fabrics perform the same. So we want to look at what factors affect the erodibility of these. And of course, the, the effect of binder content, the voids in the P200 are primary factors which affect um, stripping and erosion. So we use those and those were uh, calibrated with the performance data. So now we have erosion factors as a function of the characteristics of that inner layer, the mixture design characteristics. Um, and whether it's a asphalt inner layer or a fabric. So this was the calibration for the faulting uh, 0.7, which is, is pretty reasonable when you have field data uh, in, you know, quite high. Um, and uh, the, the predicted versus the, the actual measured. Um, just to look at a couple of things on what this does now. So now, uh, you have either a dense graded or a fabric or an open graded inner layer, and you can see the effects on the predicted faulting performance depending on whether it's very non-erodible um, or uh, if it's, um, uh, you know, more erodible. So dense graded has more fines, 
uh, more likely to erode than the open graded. And then of course the fabric is, uh, uh, does not um, erode. Uh, and also the, the binder content then. So this goes back to the erosion model and how binder content uh, affects, you know, your uh, potential for for erodibility. So how much stripping the stripping has to occur and then it can erode. So that's obviously uh, an effect of the, the binder content and the coating thickness that you have on those particles. So with that, um, I'll switch back to uh, Dr. Kazanovich if he could start sharing. And um, he'll talk about cracking and the BCOA, uh, the UBOL design uh, procedure that he um, incorporated all this into a design tool. So I stopped sharing, uh, Lev, it looks like um, you're ready to roll. Okay, um, well, uh, as Julie said, um, uh, and, and this project we also developed a new cracking model for <coughs> unbanded concrete overlay. The payment in me model uh, uh, and adapts a, a cracking model for new payments for prediction shin cracking in un unbound concrete <coughs> overlays. It treats an existing payment as a base layer and it ignores the effect of the interlayer. And this approach has several limitations, but uh, in, in addition, it's the, the predicted trends are not necessarily uh, reasonable. Uh, let's consider the, the example of like a, a heavily trafficked um, payment like <clears throat> 8,000 uh, heavy trucks per day, linear growth like 3%, 3 and thickness of the existing payment 8 inches, uh, model for assisted 4 million PSI, overlay jo joint space in uh, 15 feet and anti an untied PCC shoulder. So uh, if we simulate this system in, in payment to me, it predicts very uh, little damage of the cracking for 10 inch unpounded concrete overlays, which is reasonable, much more cracking for eight inch thick overlay, that's also reasonable. But when, but if we reduce thickness to six inches, suddenly the predicted cracking drops. And that naturally creates problems if, when you're trying to design payments. So basically it says that um, sometimes it's better to have very thin payment than thicker payment. Um, so in, uh, th uh, in this project, we adapted the payment to me framework. So we try to, to use uh, uh, <coughs> such features as the effect of uh, concrete age on concrete strength and stiffness. Uh, we consider axial load spectrum. We use modified curling analysis and modi we modified built-in curling prediction, but, uh, and we use incremental damage analysis, but we made some modifications. And what's more important, we try to make it simple so the analysis won't take um, a long time. Uh, the payment team incorporates EACM to predict temperature distribution in the uh, concrete payment system. And in this type, we simplified an analysis. So we run a large factorial of, um, of ACME runs and we created temperature frequency tab uh, table. So we uh, generated quadratic temperature distribution this approach uh, proposed by Dr. Hill and Dr. <coughs> Roessler. And basically for each location, depending on concrete combination of concrete thicknesses and um, of the overlay and the existing payment, we, uh, we generated this, this, this tables, the delta T is a linear temperature gradient and C is a, para, is a parameter that characterize the nonlinear portion of the uh, temperature distribution, or rather say a quadratic portion of the temperature distribution. And was said we analyzed 59 weather stations with um, an overlay thickness 4, 6, and, uh, and <clears throat> 8 and 10 inches. And, and for intermediate values, we interpolated the 
the frequencies. And we use the Totsky model and and Professor Wand which already said the advantage of this model for modeling of the uh, um, unbounded overlays. But in addition to this, we use the uh, feature of ISLAB that allows to vary interlay stiffnesses um, uh, in the payment structure. And we also analyze the effect of voids um, and the, uh, the existing payment caused by uh, erosion of the interlay. So basically what we consider like for bottom up cracking uh, where critical responses was at the bottom of the uh, concrete slab at the shoulder lane joint for uh, top down cracking we can use uh, the payment team approach and one axle is placed at the transfer joint and, and another is placed at the uh, <coughs> on another side of the transfer of the slab of transfer joint but in addition to this um, um, up down cracking uh, critical location at the shoulder lane joint, we also so predicted stresses on, on the top and the bottom surface of the uh, transfer joint. And those stresses uh, uh, are used for, for predicting uh, longitudinal uh, cracking damage. So for the two cracking, we also considered like two cases, uh, like no voids uh, in the interlay and and, and uh, for any, any, any inch long uh, lane wide void, and and we would interpolate damage between these two cases. So we generated a large number of ISLAP 2000 models. This shows. Um, um, model for, for prediction <clears throat> bottom-up damage from simple axial loading, this model same damage from tandem axial loading for conventional width slab, but we also considered short slabs, which means six by six slabs, and it's an example of a slab model uh, without void, and this is example of the a slab um, model with void, so in this case this uh, um, pink area if, if the area where the k value in Totsky k value is assumed to, uh, to have a small uh, you know, value like one psi per inch. And we generated a large number of neural networks, and this shows an example of one of them for, for prediction uh, and bottom uh, uh, in terms of stresses at the, at the overlays, but, but it, Total to uh, <clears throat> in more than 10 neural networks were developed for different um, slab sizes and different locations of, of the loads. We also modified the built in curl uh, um, uh, value. So we used uh, two, uh, instead of using one value as a payment in me, we are using two values for daytime and nighttime analysis and the built in curl. And, um, analysis depends on the radius of relative stiffness of the overlay, the radius of relative stiffness of the and the total system, and a joint spacing in the uh, <clears throat> overlay. And as I said, we, we consider not only transverse cracking but longitudinal cracking analysis, and we modified reliability analysis. Uh, we used a reliability-based analysis, if we have time, I'll talk about it later. But a similar analysis was developed for mean pave rigid. So we use an incremental damage approach. So in this, to simplify it, we, our increment is one year. Um, we use frequency for linear and nonlinear temperature gradients. And we use like, the total damage as sum of fatigue damage for various combinations of temperature gradients, axial types, axial locations, and so on. And, and fatigue damage is, is computed uh, at, in, in four cases, transverse bottom-up damage, transverse um, 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 top-down um, damage, which, um, uh, a transverse joint for longitudinal cracking and 
transfer joint bend, uh, bottom surface for the little kraken as well. As I said, we use two conditions, interlay without void, interlay with void, and we determine I mean, fatigue damage by interpolating between these two extremes, and we use um, uh, interlay uh, deterioration as an index, index uh, that depends on the interlay age and interlay properties. And after that, for <clears throat> each type of damage, we compute uh, fatigue um, tracking can using the payment um, tracking model. And after that, we uh, determine independently transverse cracking and longitudinal cracking and combine these two types of cracking into one uh, cracking. So basically, we say that a crack can a slab can crack either from bottom up uh, or top down, but not at the same time, and in longitudinal direction transverse, but not, on, not at the same time. So basically, basically we don't want to double count um, like in the slab. And the, and the model was calibrated using uh, LTPP database. And again, the, it, we have reasonably good predictions. So it's, uh, and after that, we, uh, perform sensitivity analysis that I don't have time to go all of them, but this summarized in the final report. And this slide shows the effect of joint spacing on the predicted cracking. Naturally, you see longer joint spacing, higher cracking is. And for reliability analysis, we, we require users to introduce uh, reliability level coefficient of variation of the overlay thickness, coefficient of variation of concrete uh, strength, and allowable cracking level at, at the end of the payment life. The program performs uh, Monte Carlo simulation of various combinations of overlay thicknesses and strength, and determine the, the percentage of the cases that uh, um, meets the, the specified cracking level requirement, and if the, uh, the threshold is not met, then in this case, concrete, the mean concrete um, thickness is increased. So, uh, so basically, we developed a standalone tool, so that when he see the screen, the user should provide uh, location of the the payments, uh, expected traffic level, joint spacing, uh, and payment strength, asphalt interlay properties or asphalt or fabric, engineer. And after uh, um, <clears> that is performed, first the program performs cracking analysis, and after that, uh, the faulting analysis, and it's uh, reports required overlay slab thickness and, and reported cracking at specified reliability, in this case 12, uh, 13% and 50% reliability, it's 2.62% as well as the reported um, um, faulting level specified reliability and and at 50% reliability. Uh, and um, then <clears throat> And to facilitate implementation of the program, we are uh, uh, finalizing right now the web-based um, program. So in this case, uh, it performs very similar operations. So basically, it mimics the desktop version and users let's um, submit input. It performs tracking analysis after that faulting analysis and eventually performs total reliability. So basically, it's, um, it, it will, and hopefully with the web-based web program, um, pro program we will not um, have, a, have to worry about installing the desktop version on the computer and the updates will be easy to manage. Um, so basically, to this concludes, um, my presentation. So, with the design of unbounded overlay is a challenging program. I don't think that the proof and study 
solved all the problems, but we feel that we've made contribution. Yeah, so for improvement of this procedure, we feel that the Totsky model it provides a simple Yastrabat approach for modeling of interlayer, and and the, the developed Kraken and Fulton model models are an improvement from the currently available models. And I would like to thank Dr. Tompkins from uh, at that time he was a postdoc at the University of Minnesota, University of Minnesota, and University of Pittsburgh students. Tom Burnham, who was a very patient uh, project manager of this project and the participating states. That concludes my presentation. I'm now we're running out of time, but if we have a, a couple minutes, uh, minutes, I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. All right, thank you, Bob and Julie. Um... We have two questions online, so I think we'll or we'll address those before we wrap this up. Okay. First one is likely for Julie. It says, how are you measuring the density of the asphalt interlayer? You want to unmute yourself, Julie. Can you hear me, Tom? Yes. Did you hear the okay. question? Yeah, how how do we measure the density of the asphalt inner layer? Mm -hmm. That might be a better question for you, Tom. I'm not quite sure how they're doing that. <laughs> to my knowledge, I don't know that it's been done. <laughs> it's one of those things, like you said, you just lay it down and uh, roll it, and uh, it's something that should be done because obviously we need that density in there. Not sure I have a better answer than that. That uh, something that need to look at. Yeah, I don't know if it's something you can use a density meter for or whatever, but uh, might be something we need to look into. Uh, another question would there be, uh, how do you address if there's a discrepancy in faulting prediction between investigated and predicted in your design? And then have you ever used a, a geotextile fabric as an interlayer in both design and construction and also what do you feel is, uh, is how the, how do they perform? Yeah, I what guess question here. With respect to discrepancy in between the predicted and the the observed behavior behavior, um, as you saw, there's you know typically I'm not sure if you're referring to um, in the calibration process or if you're referring to just if you happen to perform a check and it's not uh, as predicted. So um, in the calibration process, you're trying to optimize based on minimizing the average, you know, between the the difference in the average between, or the average of the, the difference between your predicted and the data points. So um, what you're predicting is where it should perform on average, but of course there's points that, um, you know, data in the field that might be performing differently than observed because uh, not everything is being characterized based on what you see in the field. So, you know, an example of that might be that, um, you know, for example, if you have an asphalt uh, inner layer and typically the water's running quite smooth, but then you never connect that to um, drains on the outside. Well, that's going to affect the, the performance and that's not being captured in the design process. So the, the short answer is that it's going to be some difference between what's predicted and what actually occurs in the field. On average, it should capture it, but that's also assuming that the conditions that were assumed within the design process are represented in the field. You know, the other thing too, of course, as we all know that uh, what's designed and what gets constructed might not always be the same either. So, you know, if you're looking at, well, this isn't really performing as predicted, sometimes it's uh, helpful to go back out and pull some cores and see actually what's going on and what was actually constructed in the, the field. With respect to the non-woven uh, geotextile fabrics, um, so it says, have you ever, so, you know, uh, I, maybe this was supposed to be meant for Tom or, or a, a DOT um, person that uh, might be online, but the, 
the one, the tricky thing with respect to developing a design procedure, regardless of whether it's predicting cracking or faulting, is always, you know, it's catch-22. You, you do the best you can to capture the response of the structure and the materials with your models, but if you don't have performance data to validate slash calibrate it out, then um, it's, a, it's a challenge. And so, uh, right now, I, probably most people are familiar with the, you know, the work that John Donahue and the Missouri DOT did with their nonwoven fabric, and that's starting to be out there for quite some time. And so that was used in the, the calibration process. And um, of course, Michigan and, and Minnesota have constructed some as well, but the data is relatively early on. So does that mean, you know, you just completely uh, ignore it. Well, no, you have to. And, you know, even if you look at how many years have we used the 93 guide where we're projecting, you know, that was based on a couple of million easels of loading. And, you know, a lot of times we're extending it out to 25, 50, 60. Even with pavement ME, the majority of those sections only had 23. Yet, you know, you see people designing 100 million easels or, you know, very large amounts for uh, what it is. And so you Use what you have, the information you have to get the best prediction possible, but there's always going to be, um, you know, some extrapolation. So uh, if you're looking for information um, on the non-woven, I think uh, in general, the performance both in the cracking and the, the faulting has been extremely good. Hopefully that hits the target a little bit. If not, maybe a follow-up question might help me hone in more on what you're getting at. I'm running short of little time, but I think that's good. We'll we will um, take some of these and offer them as uh, question or answers to the other ones that we don't get to. I'm gonna pose one last question. It says, does does these design account for the lane width or panel dimensions? Uh, the input screen only showed joint spacing, and it looks as though the procedure accounts for dowel diameter. Does it provide recommendations on dowel diameter relative to overlay thickness? Uh, yes, it does do both full lane width and uh, partial lane width slab sizes. And uh, yeah, the, the dowel diameter will provide, it is an input. So, you know, you'll select the diameter that gives you the performance that you desire with, you know, also keep into consideration the, the thickness and constructability. Yeah, and, 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 and what makes it different from uh, payment to me is that uh, the <clears throat> dial diameter may affect the overlay thickness because, uh, for uh, <clears throat> for the asphalt interlay because it will reduce uh, readability or, or, or potential for erosion in uh, <clears throat> in the interlayer. So basically, the Dan says yes. The dial diameter is an important in input for for this procedure. I would probably say the one caveat that we do acknowledge is that it does not account for widened slabs. That's yes, correct. that's correct. Yeah. It currently does not. That ought to be a phase two or something if there's a strong interest. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up. I thank both presenters for excellent presentations today and, and for everyone else's participation. And uh, again, we'll be, for the questions that we didn't get to, which are very few, we'll be um, posting those online within a week. So thank you again for your participation today.